Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Gentlemen. All right, been a few days. It's about time. Overdue. Uh, 10 minute English, excuse me, English and British history, number 11, King John and the Magna Carta. I would recommend watching the previous episode, either my reaction to it or right from History Matters. But that is up to you. God, introducing myself gets old. Hello, my name is Connor. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. The original link to the video will be at the top of the description below. Right below that will be the link to the Discord. Join the Discord. Love you to uh, be there if you love learning about history. Want to hang out, chill, whatever. Bunch of different topics there. We're all... Actually, most of us are good. Some of us are jerks. All right, let's go. No, you're, you're all great. Uh... Yeah, let's go. Okay. 1199 and King Richard the Lionheart is dead. Richard left no heirs and so his dominions, all of this, was to be inherited by either his brother, John, who Richard had chosen, or by his nephew, Arthur of Brittany. Arthur began a rebellion but nothing came of it and John managed to get King the French Arthur? king to accept his territorial claims. No, After I know King Arthur is not a real thing but nothing came of it and John managed to get the French king to accept his territorial claims. After becoming king, John had his first marriage annulled and instead married Isabella of Angoulême. In 1202, fighting resumed between the kings of England and France because by this point they were both getting pretty good at it. John attempted to mount a defense of the kings of England and France because by this Does that pretty much sum up the uh, Anglo-French relationship? At this point they were both getting pretty good at it. John attempted to mount a defense of his lands, but due to financial constraint and the fact that he often insulted his nobility, his ability to do so was lacking. By the end of 1204, Philippe Augustus had conquered both Normandy and Anjou, whereas Brittany had broken away from Angevin orbit on its own. Thus, within five years of John coming to the throne, only Aquitaine remained of his inheritance. Naturally, many of the remaining nobles in England were very unhappy that they had just lost some of their continental lands. The peasantry of England also found themselves upset when John levied extremely heavy taxes to pay for an attempted... So I'm going to try and cut down on my pausing, but if any, any of you guys know, how long did it take to create a, a full suit of chainmail? Because there, there's no factories or anything. You have, to, you have to put every one of those links together... So I, I am curious if anyone knows. The remaining nobles in England were very unhappy that they had just lost some of their continental lands. The peasantry of England also found themselves upset when John levied extremely heavy taxes to pay for an attempted reconquest. So by 1205, John was dishonored and disliked by his nobles, but at least he still had good relations with the church, right? Nope. The main issue between John and the church occurred during the election of the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1205. John wanted a friend and ally of his to become the new Archbishop, whereas the clerics at Canterbury Cathedral did not. The Pope, Innocent III, was appealed to, and his answer was that they were in fact both wrong, and the Pope instead consecrated a man called Stephen Langton. John was furious about this, and so banned Langton from entering England and seized Canterbury's assets and revenues. Many clergymen saw this as a step too far, and when they complained to John, he essentially declared them traitors and seized their property as well. The Pope attempted to convince the King to agree to Langton's appointment, but the King still refused, and so in 1208, the Pope ordered that church services in England were to be halted, which they were, for six years. In 1209, the Pope went further and excommunicated John as well. 1209 was an eventful year for John in England, since before his excommunication, no he invaded you. Scotland, fearing that its king, King William the Lion, was right, planning on forging an alliance with France. The invasion went well, and William agreed to pay John and would stop claiming Northumbria, so there was one success at least. This year also saw the establishment of another centre of education at Cambridge. Thus, the two major centres of learning in England had been founded, both of which would dominate English intellectual and political life for centuries to come. In 1210, the barons of Ireland revolted and John crossed the sea and crushed them shortly afterwards. Of course, it was baronial rebellion which would ultimately define John's reign, and so unsurprisingly, this would not be the last. It's important to note that barons had a justification to revolt against John because he had been excommunicated. Technically, lords owed no allegiance to their superiors who lived outside of the boundaries of the Christian faith. In practice, the reasons for revolts weren't so theological. In 1212, John forged a series of alliances against King Philippe to prepare for an invasion of France, the most notable ally being the Count of Flanders. Philippe made the first move and attacked Flanders and was himself preparing to invade England. John's barons weren't very supportive and only due to a preemptive English attack did an invasion not occur. By this time, John had realised that he needed his barons on side who had the convenient excuse of excommunication to refuse his service. 
In 1213, he and Pope Innocent came to an agreement. The king would repay the church for everything he took and importantly, it was decided that John held England as a papal fief. What this meant is that technically England belonged to the Pope and John simply ruled over it as the Pope's appointed keeper. The next year, John had secured more alliances in his war with France, the most notable being the Holy Roman Emperor, Otto IV. The decisive... I thought that after 1066... I mean, I guess you weren't invaded technically, but didn't you sort of kind of give it up? I I'm not exactly sure. ...alliances in his war with France, the most notable being the Holy Roman Emperor, Otto IV. The decisive battle was on July the 27th, the Battle of the Bouvines, which was a decisive French victory. This battle forever ruined John's chances of recovering his northern French territories, as well as earning him the nickname John Lackland, due mostly to his lack of land. That's Philippe Augustus was hilarious. now the undisputed ruler of these territories, marking an important turning point in the rise of France. John's problems went from bad to worse upon his return to England. In 1215, John's nobles revolted against him, plunging England into chaos. The rebellious nobles' approach was not to replace the king, but to force reforms. The rebels were led by Robert Fitzwalter, who in May 1215 marched what the rebels had named the Army of God into London. John knew this wasn't going to end well, and so asked Archbishop Langton to organise peace talks. What happened at these talks is one of the most famous and important events in English history, the signing of the Magna Carta at Runnymede, which is here. Magna Carta, which is Latin for Great Charter, The signing of the Magna Carta at Runnymede, which is here. Magna Carta, which is Latin for Great Charter, sought to restrict John's powers over the dispensing of justice which John had up until that point mostly used to make money. It also importantly stated that if John was to abandon his promises within... Ma uh, I know you guys, some of you... I am not missing this. Latin for Great Charter sought to restrict John's powers over the dispensing of justice which John had... Up so the Magna Carta made it so that the king couldn't dispense justice at his own whim. Up until that point, mostly used to make money. It also importantly stated that if John was to abandon his promises within Magna Carta, his barons could use force against him. John did sign- Okay, so the Magna Carta- I don't care, I'm- I'm pausing. This is seems obviously very important. So the Magna Carta was a point that changed the monarchy, that made it- slightly less powerful or maybe much less powerful and that it couldn't just dispense justice as it wanted to as it wished find the magna carta but make no mistake he had no intention of abiding by it and quickly asked the pope who was technically john's lord to annul the agreement which the pope did john's barons were none too happy about this and so armed rebellion the barons knew that john would never accept their demands and so they invited a new claimant to the throne whom they could rally behind this man was louis the son and heir of the french king philippe augustus Louis arrived in England in May 1216 and within a few months had taken all of this territory. Little more happened until John died in October of the same year and for many of the rebellious barons the reason for the war had died with the king. John had a young son, Henry, who many of the rebellious barons flocked to. The reason for this was that Henry at this point was only nine years old and thus was much less of a threat to noble interest than Louis could be. Henry was crowned King Henry III at Gloucester but he was too young to govern and so the respected nobleman William- There's a Gloucester, Massachusetts, like- Maybe if hours drive, maybe 40, you have to go around Boston, so. The Marshal Act Crown King Henry III at Gloucester, but he was too young to govern, and so the respected nobleman William Marshall acted as his regent. Being regent meant that Marshall would act with the king's authority until the king was old enough to do so himself. Marshall's first act would be to reissue Magna Carta in Henry's name to assure the other nobles that their rights would be upheld. Louis was of course not going to give up his claim to England and so the war carried on. The war was not going in Henry's favour until 1217 when William Marshall marched on Lincoln in an all or nothing battle. The Battle of Lincoln saw many of Louis's French noblemen killed, Robert Fitzwalter was captured and afterwards the town was thoroughly looted. As a result many nobles defected from Louis to Henry and after a few more battles Henry's throne was secured and Louis renounced his claim. Henry's early reign was not without its problems. Many nobles had pledged their loyalty but weren't so keen on actually providing it. Some had built castles illegally during the rebellion and refused to abandon and demolish them. To reassure Henry's authority, the Pope allowed him to be coronated again, this time in London, and most of his lords pledged allegiance under pain of excommunication. Some still refused to pledge their loyalty and so with the help of his justicia, Hubert de Burr, Henry crushed them. In 1224, Louis, now King Louis VIII of France, invaded Henry's French territories and quickly seized Poitou and most of Gascony. 
the nobles agreed to help fund an army to reinforce Gascony on the condition that Magna Carta was reissued again, which it was in 1225. This time, Magna Carta was issued willingly by a king who agreed to be bound by the laws and the advice of his nobles, a significant stepping stone in the history of the English monarchy. The nobles agreed to help fund an army to reinforce Gascony on the condition that Magna Carta was reissued again, which it was in 1225. This time, Magna Carta was issued willingly by a king who agreed to be bound by the laws and the advice of his nobles, a significant stepping stone in the history of the English monarchy. In 1220 So before that, if a noble got on the king's bad side, it could spell really bad news for the noble because the king could just make some trumped up charge and, and execute him or imprison him. The advice of his nobles, a significant stepping stone in the history of the English monarchy. In 1226, Louis VIII of France died and the throne passed to his son, whose name you'll never guess, unless you also guess Louis. This new king was only 12, and so his position was weak. Many of the nobles in Normandy, Anjou and Brittany asked for Henry to invade and reclaim his inheritance. In 1227, the regency ended and Henry began his personal rule. Three years later, he landed in Brittany with a large English army. He would remain in France until 1234 and would leave, having achieved nothing at great cost. When Henry left for France, he had placed Hubert de Burr in charge. Hubert was not particularly popular, and the faction which opposed him rallied behind a man called Peter de Roche. In 1231, after his return to England, Peter wrote to Henry claiming that Hubert was corrupt and so Henry had Hubert arrested and Peter was made justiciar. Peter almost immediately began seizing his opponent's land, which angered a certain Richard Marshall, the son of William, who complained that the king was neglecting his promises from Magna Carta. Naturally, there would only be one outcome of this disagreement, civil war. In the end, Henry agreed to remove Peter and would, from then onwards, rule on his own. Henry was so keen for peace because he was worried that during the civil war, there would only be one outcome of this disagreement, civil war. In the end, Henry agreed to remove Peter and would, from then onwards, rule on his own. Henry was so keen for peace because he was worried that during the Civil War, Louis would invade and conquer Brittany, which he did anyway. So Henry believed that his predecessors, mostly his father, had allowed royal authority and dignity to be eroded and he sought to restore it. In 1236, Henry married Eleanor of Provence in order to forge an alliance in the south of France. Three years later, Eleanor gave birth to a son, Edward, named after Edward the Confessor, who Henry revered as the paragon of English kingship. So Henry made sure to look after his wife's family and eventually they were invited over and some of them were giving important positions, an example being Eleanor's uncle, Boniface, who was made Archbishop of Canterbury. All of this preferential treatment for people who weren't the English nobility was upsetting for the English nobility since they felt I these bet. rewards were theirs by rights. Needless to say, Henry was well on his way to annoying his barons again. So in 1241, Henry's stepfather rebelled against the French king and called for Henry to land with an army to assist, which Henry did, eventually. Henry's slow response meant that the rebellion collapsed, and during the campaign there, Henry's army was soundly defeated. You guys are, are so good at explaining so much of the things uh, I ask. So I'm still but somewhat say, confused well on his way to annoying about his again. these titles. So are bar is baron a collective word to refer to all of the top nobles, or just all of the nobles and a duke? There are just all those, like, duke and... and and bear, just, I'm not exactly sure which is higher than the other or what they ascertain, or just what they refer to. I can always look it up too. So in 1241, Henry's stepfather rebelled against the French king and called by the English nobility since they felt these were all. 1241, Henry's stepfather rebelled against the French king and called for Henry to land with an army to assist, which Henry did, eventually. Henry's slow response meant that the rebellion collapsed and during the campaign there, Henry's army was soundly defeated at the Battle of Tyburg. As a result of this, Henry's French relatives by marriage ended up leaving France and coming to England in 1247. These relatives were granted numerous lands which further annoyed the English nobility. By 1258, Henry was extremely unpopular. He had financially ruined the kingdom, the most notable event occurring in 1252 when the Pope offered Henry Sicily providing he paid off the Pope's debt, which he agreed to without consulting his lords. Furthermore, Henry also travelled to Paris where he agreed to renounce his claims to his lost territories. The anger of his nobles culminated in rebellion, again. Led by Simon de Montfort, the rebels demanded Henry abandon his personal rule and allow the nobles to control the government and institute reforms. These reforms are summed up in the provisions of Oxford, which limited the powers of the king and the major no nobles, but most importantly set up an elected group of barons who would run the kingdom. This form of government broke down after Henry had asked for the Pope's help in denouncing it, and in 1263 the Second Baron's War broke out. Long story short, the war waged for four years. Henry and his son Edward were captured at the Battle of Lewis. Edward eventually escaped and later won a victory at the Battle of Eversham, which saw de Montfort killed. By 1267, the barons had surrendered and the war was over, leaving a now unwell Henry to rebuild. Prince Edward was given greatest say over the running of the kingdom until he went on a crusade in 1270. 
Henry died in 1272 and Edward old. was declared king and upon his return to England he was crowned King Edward I. Edward, however, is better known either. What news of the North? I have named Philip my High Council. Is he qualified? I am skilled in the arts of war and military tactics, sire. Are you really? Well, what advice would you have to give on the current situation? Ah! Such a great movie. <gasps> Shh. Not my gentle son. Mere sight of him would encourage them to invade the whole... Alright, I'm sorry. Such a great movie. I couldn't resist. There is Edward Longshank, so more famously is Malleus Scotorum, the Hammer of the Scots. What? I hope Who's you enjoyed this episode and thank you for awesome. watching. There are some book recommendations in the... Braveheart next? Uh, great episode as always. I'm going to react to the next one right now. 12.30. In a different video though. See you next time, guys.